ओ भद्र कर्णे शृणुयाम देवा भद्र पश्येक्षजत्राह स्थिरंगैस्तुष्टवागम सस्तनो व्यषेम देवहित यदायु स्वस्ति न इंद्रो वृद्धश्रवा स्वस्ति न पूषा विश्व स्वस्ति नस्ताक्ष्यो अरिष्ट स्वस्ति नो बृहस्पतिर्दा ओ शांति 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 ओम ओ गॉड्स मे बी हियर ऑस्पिशियस वर्ड्स विथ आर इयर्स वाइल एंगेज इन सैक्रिफाइसिस may we see auspicious things with our eyes while praising the gods with steady limbs may we enjoy a life that is beneficial to the gods may indra of ancient fame be auspicious to us may the all knowing pusha god of the earth be propitious to us may garuda the destroyer of evil be well disposed towards us may brihaspati ensure our welfare Om peace 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 So we are studying the second section of the second mundaka in the mundaka upanishad and we had looked at the sixth mantra last time if i'm not wrong yes mantra number 7 यर्वज्ञसर्वेश महिमा भुवि दिव्य ब्रह्मपुरे व्योम्यात्मा प्रतिष्ठि मनोमय प्राण शरीर नेता प्रतिष्ठि हृदय सन्निधाय तद्ज्ञान पिपश्य धीरा आनंद अमृत यदाति Here is the translation from Swami Gambhir Ananda. That self which is omniscient in general and all-knowing in detail and which has this glory in this world, that self which is of this kind is seated in the space within the luminous city of Brahman. It is conditioned by the mind. It is the carrier of the vital forces in the body. It is seated in food by placing the intellect in the cavity of the heart. Through their knowledge, the discriminating people realize the self as existing in its fullness everywhere the self that shines surpassingly as blissfulness and immortality all right a very beautiful mantra we'll take a close look at it in this section very powerful mantras we have come across and their rest of the section is also of that it's keyed to a very high pitch the highest and the essential teachings of the upanishads the highest and the essential teaching of vedanta is given in these mantras that you are brahman the identity of the jiva and paramatma jivatma paramatma aikya the identity of the individual sentient being and the absolute reality the identity of you and brahman that is stated again and again in these very beautiful poetic sublime mantras we know how the upanishad started with the student asking the teacher sir what is that by knowing which everything is known and the teacher replied that it is the akshara the imperishable it is brahman basically it is being itself existence itself which appears with names and forms as this entire universe so if you know that brahman that akshara you know everything just as if by by knowing what clay is we understand what all clay pottery is by knowing what gold is we understand all golden ornaments by knowing water we understand what all the waves are similarly by knowing brahman or by knowing the akshara the same thing the word used was akshara we know everything in that sense now what is this brahman or akshara it is you yourself it is you yourself with names and forms this pure being appears as this entire universe i repeat that being existence is this entire universe with names and forms just as um clay with various names and pots are the diff- uh, names and uh, forms are the different uh, uh, pots and jars and um, all sorts of 
um, you know, clay pottery. Only the names are different, the forms are different, but the material is the same clay. Similarly, the material is the same Brahman, same existence. Names and forms are different. Names, forms, and functions are different. That's this universe. So by knowing that Brahman, you realize that um, you, you know everything else. You know, you know everything in this universe. So with names and forms, that very existence is this entire universe. And with names and forms in the mind, in, the, in our minds, that very existence, that Brahman is also not just existence, but it's also awareness or consciousness. That becomes manifest in the mind. And as we shall see in this mantra itself, that when the mind is sattvic, that same Brahman not only manifests as existence of the mind, not only manifests as the consciousness in the mind, but also manifests as bliss in the mind. And therefore, sat, chit, ananda, existence, consciousness, bliss. In itself, what that reality is, we cannot say precisely, but it, except that it is you. But we see it manifested in the very existence of the universe. We see it manifested in every cognition, in every um, uh, experience of awareness. And we see it manifested in bliss, in fulfillment, in meaning in life. So that is Sat Chid Ananda. And that's you. Now, in this seventh mantra, he's saying, Ya Sarvagya Sarvavit. This is a phrase which comes once in a while in the Upanishads. That reality, which is the knower of all things. And omniscient, the two words literally mean the same thing. The omniscient and the omniscient. Sarvagya, all-knowing. And Sarvavit, all-knowing. But there's a difference here. One, Sarvagya, one way it is, in, it is understood is Sarvascha Gyascha. Sarva means everything. Gya means consciousness. So that which is everything. The entire universe, all things in this universe, they are this Brahman. How? Because they, all of them exist. If they did not exist, we wouldn't consider them at all. They wouldn't enter our, our conversation. So whatever exists in this universe, from the tiniest particle to the most massive um, uh, astronomical structures, the superstructures, from uh, the most abstract things in the universe, the most concrete, all of them exist. And Vedanta draws our attention to existence, to being, to isness. So, Sarvaha, Brahman is all. How is Brahman all? Is it a collection of all things? Is it like a, um, you know, like a storage space out there you can see? Lots of stuff is stored there. So, Brahman is like that, a collection, not collection. Brahman is all in the sense of existence itself. Also, Brahman um, is consciousness, awareness. So, gya, gya means gyapti, the Sanskrit word, which means pure consciousness, awareness. Gya, gyapti, these are same meaning, uh, means consciousness. So, being consciousness is Brahman. So, this is a special derivation, special uh, interpretation of the word sarvagya. Remember, sarvagya in Sanskrit and in many Indian languages, it just means all knowing, uh, omniscient. But here it means that which is all and that which is knowing. It means basically sat and chit. So that's one way of understanding sarvagya. And the other one, sarvavit, all knowing again. Here it is the more conventional meaning of um, omniscient. Omniscient. Literally knowing everything. Like all the facts are there in the encyclopedia. If you read the encyclopedia, um, so you are knowing everything, you know everything there is to know. So in that sense, God knows everything. God is supposed to be omniscient. So here, Sarva with omniscient in the sense of all-knowing, knowing everything at once, whatever it was in the past, whatever is there now, whatever is there in the future, whatever is in our minds, all of us, all our thoughts, feelings, whatever we are aware of, not aware of, all of it is known at once. And that is uh, omniscient, Sarva with. And existence consciousness, sarvagya. In another way, uh, these two words are telling us that which is nirguna brahman and that which is saguna brahman. Sarvagya, all and consciousness, being and consciousness. Satchit, what is that? Nirguna brahman, the absolute reality. Sarvavit, 
omniscient. Who is omniscient? Only God is other. Bhagavan, Ishwara, Saguna Brahman is omniscient. That which is Nirguna Brahman and Saguna Brahman. Are they two components of that ultimate reality? No, no, no. The ultimate reality is Nirguna Brahman. With Maya, it becomes or it appears as Saguna Brahman. That's the Advaitic interpretation. Yes, Sarvagya Sarvavit. Notice the very extraordinarily beautiful, sublime hymn written by Swami Vivekananda about Sri Ramakrishna, which is sung in all the ashrams of the Ramakrishna mission, uh, Ram our, in all our monasteries and ashrams in the evening, in the Arati. Uh, so it's a very, it sounds Sanskrit, but it's actually a heavily Sanskritized Bengali. It's composed by Vivekananda as an evening hymn to Sri Ramakrishna. And yet, Sri Ramakrishna is never mentioned. It's very impersonal, the entire uh, hymn. But you can clearly see he's talking about, Swami so Vivekananda is talking about Sri Ramakrishna. Now in the first line, Nirguna Gunamai. Nirguna Gunamai. Nirguna, absolute reality, pure being, pure consciousness, pure bliss, Satchidananda, which are not qualities. They are it. They are Brahman. Gunamai, which is possessed of all auspicious qualities, innumerable auspicious qualities. What is that? Saguna Brahman, Ishwara, Bhagavan. So both. These are two aspects. One is the ultimate reality. The other one is, is its manifestation as God, Ishwara. Yes, Sarvagya Sarvavit. That reality, which is the absolute transcendent and also the Ishwara, the God of this universe. Or literally, Sarvagya, all and consciousness and all-knowing, omniscient. Yasesha Mahima Bhuvi. Whose grandeur glory is this universe? This universe is the glory of Brahman. See, this universe is not bad. This universe is not something that you, you need to make it disappear. This is your glory. You are Brahman and your glory is this universe. It's not a problem to be um, overcome. It's not a hassle to be avoided. It's also... It's not something tremendously desirable which we have to keep chasing in order to get our own fulfillment. No. It is your glory. You, you possess it already and you will always possess it. So what is this glory of, of uh, Brahman? The universe is the glory of Brahman. And in what ecstatic terms the commentator Shankaracharya describes the glory of Brahman. This particular universe, this universe itself is the glory of Brahman. How? Um, I will just translate a few Lines from the commentary by Adi Shankaracharya. How is this universe the glory of Brahman, of their absolute reality? Koso Mahima, what is the glory of Brahman? And then he goes on. I mean, very uh, wonderful language. Just see. Yasya me dhyava prithibhyo shasane vidrite tishthata surya chandramaso yasya shasane alata chakravad ajasram brahmataha. Because of which under the rule of which, under by the support of which, which means existence, being, your reality. Because of which, the sky and the earth are set. Because of which, world, the sun and the moon and all the luminous bodies across the sky, the stars and the sun and all, they whirl like Alata Chakra, like a firebrand being whirled around. They endlessly whirl around in the vast cosmos. Because of what? Because of existence itself. Because of being itself. Because of you. Your reality. Then he goes on. Yasya shasane sarita sagarascha sagarascha swagocharam swagocharam natikrabanti Because of which the roaring oceans and um, rivers and seas and they, the, the turbulent oceans and all, they, do, they um, you know, dash against the limits, the shores and never uh, cross them. Uh, it is, is describing the the oceans of the earth. Stavaram tata stavaram jangamam ja yasya shasane niyatam. All living beings, whether they are moving or non-moving, they live because of you, the existence, Brahman. And then he says, because of whom the the seasons rotate endlessly, the years come and go, the half years and the full years, the time passes. Um, tata kattara karmani phalam cha yat shasanat swam swam kalam nati vattanti. Because of whom the invisible law of karma, 
gives rise to its effects, sure effects at the appropriate time in the lives of all beings. Our lives keep changing and things keep happening to us, good and bad, um, expected, unexpected, all flowing from past karma, which are ancient and forgotten by all, except by Saguna Brahman, Ishwara, Bhagavan, and from whom come all these. So all of these, very poetically describes. What is he describing? Mahima Bhuvi, this universe, the glory that is this universe. Whose glory? It's the ornament. It's like a necklace or it's an ornament for uh, for Brahman, for existence. What is the glory of the movie screen? The movies. The various wonderful movies which are played on the movie screen. That's the glory of the screen. It's not a problem for the screen. See, a tremendous explosion on the movie screen. Does it burn the movie screen? No. A great flood on the movie screen. Does it make the movie screen even a little bit wet? No. A great earthquake. Does it crack the movie screen? No. Rather, all those tremendous happenings in the movies are just the glory of the movie screen. Like that, you are that one being, that one consciousness, that movie screen for the universe. It is your glory. Whatever good and bad is happening, all of it is the glory of Brahman, your glory. Then he says, Divye Brahma Pure Hyesha. Uh, in the shining city of Brahman. So, um, shining, why shining? He says, Divye Dyotanavati. Why is it shining? Why is Brahman shining? Sarva Bauddha Pratyaya Krita Dyotani Brahma Pure. He says, every cognition is shining. So look at your own experience in this way. You are light shining. Basically, what are we? We are light shining, not material light. How are you shining? When you see things, when you hear and smell and taste and touch, you're shining. These are all experiences um, flashing in you, the consciousness. When you um, think and remember, when you desire and hate, when you're calm and restless, it's all shining, light shining. Look at it. All of it is the play of consciousness. Or all of it is consciousness on which this play of the vrittis are going on. What he calls Sarva Bauddha Pratyaya. Bauddha Pratyaya, vrittis of the buddhi. Sarva, all kinds, good and bad, whatever is going on in every mind, they're all illumined. And where is this going on? Brahmapuri, in the city of Brahman. Oh, what city is that? Which country? How do I get there? What's the visa? for <laughs> It, the city of Brahman is this body. City of Brahman is this body. You, the, right now, this body is the city of Brahman. Um, then he says, Brahmapure, Brahmano Atra Chaitanya Swarupena Nitya Bhivyaktatva Brahmana Puram Ridaya Pundarikam. He says, This the city of Brahman is your heart. Heart here means, first of all, it means the physical heart where you focus. Then it means, physical heart means here it means the center of the body, not the actual biological heart. Center of the body for focusing. And then the mind, because Upanishads and all, they, they thought that the mind was centered in the heart here. And we also, you know, when we refer to ourselves, we don't refer to here I am. We refer to, or we don't say here I am. We say here I am. I am this, you know. We have a kind of emotional center here at least. So anyway, First, locate in the physical center of the body. Uh, and then, what it means is the mind. And what it means in the mind, consciousness. So, in the physical center of the body, the mind. Pay attention to the mind. In the mind, consciousness. So, that consciousness. Shankaracharya here comments. Chaitanya Swarupena Nitya Bhivyaktatvat Always shining as consciousness. Where? Uh, in the in the space, in the space of the heart, he says, "Ridaya pundarikam." In the lotus of the heart, what what he means by the lotus of the heart is not a lotus. It's not even the heart. In, in mind, there is consciousness always shining in every experience. Indeed, even in the absence of the movements of the mind, with all the movements, he says, "Sarva bauddha pratyaya." All movements of the mind, all vrittis of the buddhi, when all vrittis have subsided in deep sleep, then also consciousness. Is shining. Just, he says, it will not be manifest. Nitya abhivyakta. 
It will not be manifest in deep sleep. But all experiences in waking, all experiences in dream, and all the deep sleep um, is, is illumined by this consciousness. So it is the city of Brahman, where in the body, in the center of the body, in the mind, in every movement of the mind, that is, that is the city of Brahman. And it is shining there. There, in the, in the, he says, in Brahmapure, in the uh, lotus of the heart, there is a space. The space in the lotus of the heart, which is basically where the mind manifests itself. Vyomni Atma Pratishthitaha. In that space, the self shines. Shankaracharya is very clear here. Tasmin Yad Vyoma. Whatever space is there in the center of the body, in the heart here. Tasmin Vyomni Akash in the space. Rit Pundarika Madhyasti. In the center of the lotus of the heart. Pratishtita, the Atman shines there, is, is established there. But established there, he's, he's very rational here. Eva Upalabhyat, it seems to be established there. Of course, it's not that pure consciousness, Brahman, the Absolute, is in the center of the body, uh, in the space right behind, uh, you know, in the center of the chest. No, no, no. He, he says, Shankaracharya says, Nahi akashavat sarvagatasya gati agati pratishtha vanyatha sambhavati. Brahman, pure being, pure consciousness is all pervading like space. Space, you cannot say space exists here, space is coming, space is going, or space is established somewhere. No. That which is all pervading is always there. Similarly, even more than space is being itself, awareness itself, in which space is manifest. So it's not that that awareness, that consciousness, Atma, Chaitanya consciousness is somehow centered here. It, it is as if centered there. It's a good place to meditate. It's a good place to center yourself. But Brahman and Atman is everywhere. Even more precisely, everywhere is in Brahman or Atman. Even more precisely, everywhere is an appearance in Brahman or Atman. Then, so this is the, this is the first two lines. That which is all, that which is consciousness, that which as Saguna Brahman or, or the God of the universe is all-knowing, for whom this entire universe is a glory. Where is it? In you. Really? In me? Where? In the city of Brahman, with, within you. Where is the city of Brahman within me? In the center of your body, in the center of your chest. Oh, here? Yes. In the lotus of the heart, there is a space. Oh, in that little space, there's Brahman. Yes, as if. As if. Why as if then? Because it's a very good place to locate or to meditate or to realize it. Then he goes on. Well, all right. The important point takeaway here is, in the first line, he's talking about Nirguna Brahman, Saguna Brahman, the God of this universe. But in the second line, what is he talking about? You. <laughs> in the space of the heart. Who is that consciousness in the space of the heart, in, in the mind? You. We all. We all would agree right away with, without any Vedanta or anything like that. I am this awareness in this body-mind. That's how we define ourselves. If you, if you rationally try to understand, or the word is phenomenologically, how does it feel? How do you feel? You feel like an awareness, of, but of course you still feel that there's a mind, there's a body, there's a personality. So this awareness which is shining through this mind-body in this personality, this embodied awareness, this is how we think of ourselves. And he's saying that embodied awareness is Brahman, for which through Maya, the entire universe is the glory of that Brahman, and which in its real nature is neither Saguna Brahman, nor you the sentient being, it is just the absolute existence consciousness place, the absolute being. It is an identity statement. Paramatma, Jivatma, the Supreme Soul and the individual soul, they are one. Brahman and Jiva, Brahman and the sentient being are one. Then the remaining four lines. Again, very powerful and beautiful. Mano Maya Prana Sharira Neta. So, this consciousness, a very interesting term is used. Mano Maya. Now here, Mano Maya does not mean, you know, when we study the five. Koshas, 
the five sheets or the five levels of the human personality, the physical, the vital, the mental, the intellectual, and the causal. And so, Annamaya, Pranamaya, Manomaya, Vigyanamaya, Anandamaya. Here, it's not that Manomaya. It's something related. What it means here, it actually means consciousness. Manomaya means that consciousness which illumines the mind. That consciousness which is surrounded by the mind. Which is shining in the mind. Therefore, it is called Manomaya. That which shines and pervades the mind. That consciousness, Prana Sharira Neta. Which takes away the prana, the, the um, vital forces and the subtle body. At the um, time of death, it takes away this subtle body from one physical body which is dying to another physical body which will be born. Here is referring to reincarnation. It's referring to reincarnation. So the idea that we, we are not this body. We have gone, we have existed in many bodies in er, earlier. We are in this body now. When the, this body goes, we shall continue. Now this continuance is due to this Atman also. Because of the background Atman, because of Brahman, because of pure consciousness, this subtle body will transmigrate. It will not be destroyed at the death of the physical body. It will transmigrate. It will punarjanma, what is called punarjanma. It goes from one physical body to another physical body from the old and dying physical body to the baby which will be born. Uh -huh. Shankaracharya says, Neta sthula sharira antaram prati. Sthulat sharirat sharira antaram prati. That which leads from a physic gross physical body to another physical body. Reincarnation. This question of reincarnation. You can see this is very ancient doctrine found not only in the Gita, but earlier than that, in the Upanishads, throughout the Upanishads, you find clearly this uh, doctrine of birth and rebirth, many lives. It is spread across the Upanishads. Now, a subtle point here. What has been mentioned here is that this one Atman, changeless Atman, it um, is the background, it is, gives the existence to this entire cycle of birth and death. The subtle body goes into a new body and then that physical body is born and you become a person for some time existing there. Then that person dies, the physical body dies, the subtle body goes on to another body. And then we are taught that you do your spiritual practices, you realize that you know you have God realization, enlightenment, this entire process of being limited in one body mind and going from birth to death to birth, the cycle of birth and death will come to an end. This is the story. But Advaita Vedanta says, the Vedantic um, teaching here is, that's not the real meaning. The deeper understanding is this. The surface understanding is, going from birth to death, being born, coming into existence, aging, dying, and again being born, coming into existence as a person, and then living and then dying and so on. And the stopping of this birth and death this is called God realization. This is called moksha. This is what, what we have been asked to understand. We have been taught. It's a good preliminary first step. But the real meaning is God, Brahman, Atman, your real nature is not that which is born. Is also not that which will become free of this cycle of birth and death. No, no, no. It's not that which is passes away and the stopping of that passing away. That is freedom. No. The birth and the death, coming into being as a body and then passing away. And also the ultimate freedom from the cycle of passing away, of, of dying again and again. Uh, this is only a first step to understanding you are that absolute reality which was never born, which never passed away. And therefore, consequently, this freedom from the cycle of being born and passing away, this is not does not apply to you. You were and are and always will be perfectly all right, perfectly free. You're never trapped in this cycle. Just as you witnessed uh, the, you know, terrible experiences. Oh, good example is TV serial. So one hero goes through many episodes. Each episode, something bad or good happens and you watch it. And you are thinking uh, that... Um, 
you know, so what will happen next and all the good and bad things which happened in the past. This is the history of this person. And then when will this person be freed? But when that blessed serial comes to an end, we realize neither that person ever existed, though it appeared. It was experienced. It was engrossing to watch, but it was, it was never there. Nor did that person ever go through those travails. And nor is that person actually being freed from those travels, so to say. Because that person was never there. What was there? You, the watcher, and into you was appearing a show. So what we consider ourselves to be right now, this person, is like a, like a character in that TV serial of our life. And each episode is one life for us. <laughs> multiple lifetimes. But really, we are not this character, nor are we this show. So here, the preliminary teaching is given. Because of the Atman, this game is going on. But it points to the fact that uh, the Atman actually is not going through this game. The Atman is not born, does not age, does not die, does not go from one birth to another. What goes? He says, prana, sharira, neta. The subtle body goes from one body to another, one physical body to another body. But you are. And even that subtle body going from one physical body to another body is an appearance. Is part of the movie. That also is not an ultimately real occurrence. Pratishthito vanne ridayam sannidhaya. Where is the Atman? It is Literally it means established in food. But if food means the Annamaya Kosha. Here in this body. Ridayam in the sacred space of the heart. As the mind, in the mind, as consciousness. I'll repeat. Where is the Atman if you ask? Here in the body, physical body. An anna means Annamaya, physical body. Where in the physical body? Sacred space of the heart. Where, what do you mean sacred space of the heart? If you make uh, cardiac uh, surgeon probes it, will you find the Atman? No, no, no. Sacred space of the heart is indicating the mind. Oh, the mind. Well, I have a mind. Which one? What is in my mind which is the Atman? Not the thoughts. Not the feelings. Not the emotions. Not the memories. Not the perceptions. But you, the consciousness illumining the perceptions, feelings, memories, even the ego sense, all are illumined by you, the consciousness. That consciousness is the Atman. Here he says, Pratishthito Varne Hridayam Sannidhaya. Very close, established in the Annamaya Kosha, as the heart, in the heart, the mind, in the mind consciousness is you. All right, so what do we do about all this? Tadvigyanena paripashyanti dhira. So dhira, you are the dhira, the heroic one, the patient one, the spiritual seeker, the fully qualified spiritual seeker. What do you mean fully qualified? Remember, it was already said in the beginning of the Upanishad. So tadvigyanartham gurumeva vigachet. So that person who has got all the qualifications, who has viveka, vairagya, the disciplines and mumukshutvam, the capacity for discernment, dispassion for the world, the sixfold discipline, sixfold treasures, disciplines, and an intense desire for freedom. That fully qualified uh, student, um, he says, so that, for, that person is called a dhira. It's a word again and again used for the qualified spiritual seeker in the Upanishads. What do they do? Tad vigyanena, vigyanena, by spiritual knowledge. What spiritual knowledge? What is meant by spiritual knowledge here? Paravidya, the higher knowledge. Remember, Upanishad starts with two kinds of knowledge. Para, apara, the higher, supreme, and the lower or the relative. That higher knowledge which reveals to you Brahman or Akshara by which everything is known. How does it reveal to you? It reveals to you Brahman or Akshara as you, your real nature, as I, uh, the witness consciousness. Um, how do you get that? Shavana manana nididhyasana. You go to a guru and um, the, the teacher will expound to you the Upanishads and other associated texts will expound to you Vedanta. You listen carefully, think about it, meditate upon it and you will realize. Tadvigyana here means Brahmagyana. More precisely, Brahmakara vritti. The knowledge that I am Brahman. This flashes. And what will be the realization? Ananda Rupam Amritam Yad Vibhati. What a beautiful phrase. 
that which continuously blazes forth as uh, bliss, as immortal bliss, or that which blazes forth as immortal bliss, ananda rupam, ananda rupam, as, as bliss, amritam, immortal, yad vibhati, that which blazes forth. How is it blazing forth? In every experience, it's blazing forth. It's shining forth, but we don't ex we don't recognize it. Shankaracharya says, just as the clay in a clay pot is irresistibly presenting itself to us, unstoppably presenting itself to us. If you look at the clay pot, you're already looking at the clay. In fact, you're looking at nothing but the clay. It's in the same way, this Brahman, which he beautifully calls Ananda Rupa Mamritam, immortal bliss. This is blazing forth before us all the time. We don't recognize it. This is what Vivekananda called the open secret. Secret because we don't recognize it. Uh, but it's open because it's always blazing forth. So, very deliberately he has used the term Ananda. We most obviously Brahman is manifested everywhere as Sat. Ease, ease, ease. Table is, computer is. Chair is, man is, woman is, space is. And it's manifested in our experience as consciousness. Not only as isness, not only do you exist, but you shine as awareness. So in the mind, so in all things with names and forms, whatever exists in the universe has names and forms. In all names and forms, as existence, Brahman is manifest. But in a particular kind of name and form called mind, Brahman is manifest not only as existence, but also as awareness, consciousness. And in a particular state of that mind, called sattvic mind, Brahman is manifest not only as existence, not only as consciousness, but also as bliss. Now you might say, so only in that particular state of the mind, Brahman is manifest, manifest as conscious as bliss. It doesn't mean that Brahman is not bliss. Brahman is always bliss. Even if the mind loses its sattvic state, even if the mind becomes restless, even if the mind becomes uh, mind falls asleep and uh, consciousness is not manifest, bliss is not manifest, Brahman still continues to be consciousness and bliss, just not manifest. So its manifestation requires name and form. All names and forms manifest sat, existence. Some names and forms called mind manifest not only existence, but also consciousness. And by the way, these I am not stipulating this, I am not claiming this. Just take a look. In your own experience, everything is, 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 existence. All names and forms clearly are manifesting existence. And in your own mind, not only does the mind, by, by mind I mean thoughts, feelings, emotions, not only do they exist, even if for a short while, they also are, they shine in awareness. So awareness is manifested by the mind, by the vrittis of the mind. And when the mind is peaceful and, joy, and, and uh, sattvic, Joy is manifest. A kind of natural joy is manifested. That's the manifestation of Ananda. It's not pure Ananda by itself. Pure Ananda, pure consciousness, pure existence is you. Its manifestation is, is seen in all names and forms. So when the um, names and forms disappear, the manifestation disappears. But you don't disappear. The mirror manifests your face. You put a mirror in front of you, it manifests your face. But if you knock the mirror out, the mirror will be gone. The manifestation of your face will be gone. But the real face, your face is not gone. You are still there. So, ananda rupam amritam yad vibhati. That you as existence are always there, whether it's manifest or not. You as consciousness are always there, whether it's manifest or not. You as bliss, you're always there, whether it's manifested or not. That always their existence, consciousness, bliss is called Amritam, immortality. Here Shankaracharya says, here, Tadatma Tattvam, this nature, this truth about the self, about yourself. Vijyanena Vishishtena, by the uh, special knowledge, spiritual knowledge. Um, how does it come? Shastra Acharya Upadesha Janitena Gyanena. The knowledge which is born of, which is generated by the teachings given by the Acharya, teacher, expounding the text, not free thinking by the teacher, 
giving some pravachan lecture. No, it must be expounding the Upanishad and the text based on the Upanishad like Gita, Brahma Sutras and all the Prakarana Granthas. All of them teach the same teaching that you are this Brahman. When it is taught by the Acharya to the student. Which student? Shama, Dhamma, Dhyana, Sarvatyaga, Vairagya, Udbhutena. So, the student in whom these qualities are there, control of the mind, control of the senses, meditation, um, renunciation, uh, dispassion, that means the fourfold qualifications basically are there. Paripashyanti, they see. See means uh, they experience or they realize an already existing truth. Where do they see it? Oh, in the heart. No, everywhere. Sarvata. Paripashyanti means everywhere. In, everywhere, every when, all the time, everywhere, in every experience. Sarvata Purnam. This entire universe filled with one existence. In Hindi they say, Thasar Thas Bharpur. <laughs> Packed to the brim with Brahman. He says, Pashyan sees Upalabhandi. It, it is an experience. Now, it's not a particular experience. Once this knowledge flashes, every experience manifests this knowledge. In every experience, we'll see Brahman. Who are these dhira? He gives a nice uh, term. Vivekina. Those who are these discerning. Those who practice this discernment. I am not the body, not the mind, not the intellect, not even the blankness beyond the intellect. I am the witness consciousness. They are vivek, you know, those who are viveki, those who practice viveka, dis discernment. Ananda rupam. What is this ananda rupam? What is ananda? Sarva anatta dukkha ayasa prahinam. Devoid of every travail, every um, you know, varying effect of life, samsara, every sorrow, anatta, every disaster to befall us, devoid of all of that, yad vivhati. Which shines. And where does it shine? Swatman Neva, in your very self, as yourself, it shines continuously. So, what a beautiful. Let me quickly read that. Yes, Sarvagya, Sarvabi, Yasesha, Mahima, Bhuvi, that which is all, that which is consciousness, that which is as God omniscient, the knower of all, for whom this universe is a glory, not a problem. Divye Brahma Pure Hyesha Vyomni Atma Pratishthitaha. Where is that? It's in you. It's in the in it's in you. Where in me? In the shining city of Brahman. What is the city of Brahman? The lotus of the heart. Why is it shining? In what way is it shining? Uh, it is that which lights up every movement of the mind, every cognition, every perception. And it's located in the as if located in the sacred space of the heart. And then he goes on to say, Mano Mayaha. It is that consciousness which is surrounded by the cognitions, by the emotions, by you, you, the awareness. And that which is the background to the transmigration of the soul. See, the whole theory of uh, being born and aging and dying and again and again and again and being free of this cycle is enlightenment, freedom. He says, no, 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 you are actually free. It's true, this cycle is going on, but you are actually free of it. That's being pointed to it. By this. Pratishthita Vanne. It's right here established in this Annamaya Kosha. In this physical body which is a product of food. Uh, in the heart of this. As if. That is where you focus. From the heart to the mind. to the From the mind to the witness of the mind. Tadvigyanena. There is a special way of doing it. It can't be done by force. It can't be done by superstition. It can't be done by just by belief. Good to start with belief that it's all true, but let you must realize this. And the way of realizing it, you have to go to the teacher who will expound the text to you, show you Drigdrishya Viveka, Panchakosha Viveka, and the method of the seer and the seen, the method of the five layers of the human personality, the method of Avasthatraya Viveka, method of the three states, waking, dreaming, deep sleep. All of them are different ways of pointing to you. And you will realize Ananda Rupam Amritam Yad Vibhati, that which blazes forth forever as bliss and immortality. How beautiful. Then the next mantra, yes, we can do that. 
the eighth mantra. Very, very important. What is enlightenment? What constitutes enlightenment? The test of it and the result of it. So, basically this, this mantra is often quoted by Shankaracharya in his commentaries. What will happen with all of this? And how do I know that I am enlightened? What will I get out of it? Here. Number 8. Vidyate hridaya granthi chidyante sarvasamshaya shiyante chasya karmani tasmindrishte paravare Beautiful. Let us see Gambhiranji's translation. The result of this knowledge. When that self which is both the high and the low is realized, the knot of the heart gets untied, all doubts become solved and all one's actions become dissipated. All right, there's a lot here. Tasmin drishte paravare. The word used is paravara. Para means higher, supreme. Avara means um, lower, relative. Paravara means that which is both the supreme, higher, and the lower, the relative. So, what is the supreme, the higher? Um, the cause, the cause of this universe. What is the lower and the relative? The effect. In Sanskrit, karana, karya. Para, the supreme, higher, is cause. Uh, effect is the uh, relative, the lower. What am I talking about? What is all this cause and effect? Remember, again, go back to um, the beginning of the Upanishad. Sir, what is that by knowing which everything can be known? Now, the, the question has to be put in a proper format. The answer will become easy. Everything, everything in this universe is what? It's an effect. These are all effects. Effect means products. They've all come from something. There's a cause for everything. So you want to know everything. Yes. But everything is an effect. Yes. It's a product. So you want to know all the products, all the effects. Yes. Now I begin to see where you are leading. If you want to know all the effects, all the karyam, then you must know the cause, the karanam. If you want to know all the pots, whatever pottery there is and whatever can be from clay, then you must know the, the cause, the material cause of all of these pots. What is that? Clay. So when you know clay, you will realize whatever pots there are made of this particular clay and whatever can be made in future, whatever has been made in the past, all of it was, is and will be only clay. Similarly, what is that? from which everything is made. It is Brahman, with the power of Maya, through the power of Maya, appears with many names and forms and functions, this entire universe. It is being itself, existence itself. So the, what is cause? Sat, being, Akshara, Brahman, whatever you call it, with the power of Maya, that is the cause, that is para. And what is the effect? The effect is this entire universe, everything. Put in another way, what is the Para, the higher, God. What is Avara, the lower? This person, the individual being like us, with body, mind, personality, and of course consciousness. Now, what is being said here is, that reality which you are talking about is Paravara, is, this, is both the, the cause and the effect. What is that which is the cause? And what is that which is the effect? That is Brahman. The example, the ocean, will. I have given the example many times. What is the lower? The wave. What is the higher? The ocean. All waves taken together. But what is that which is both wave and ocean? Water. Water alone appears as all the ocean. And every wave that may be born in the ocean, play around in the ocean and dissipate back into the ocean. Ocean itself is nothing but water. What is that which appears as this being here, you and I, uh, clothed in a physical body, in a pranic body, uh, in a mental body, in an uh, intellectual body, and in the causal 
deep sleep body. What is that? That consciousness. What is that which uh, appears as this entire universe? And it is the same consciousness in association with the power of Maya, Ishwara. With the five, five bodies, five layers, or three bodies, Karana, Kshukshma, Stula, causal, subtle, and gross. Or the five bodies, Annamaya, Pranamaya, Manomaya, Vigyanamaya, Anandamaya, the five sheets. It is the same one consciousness. Apart from the individual and the cosmic, apart from God and individual beings, Paramatma, Jivatma, what is it? It is consciousness only, bare consciousness only, bare being only, pure being or pure consciousness. Who is that? I am that. You are that. So, Tasmin Drishte Paravare, when one that para avara, this word is what uh, noting, the higher and the lower. I just mentioned every day we sing to Sri Ramakrishna, Nirguna Gunamaya. Of course, here higher and lower means Saguna Brahman and the product, which is Jagat and Jiva. And the cause of both is the Nirguna, is the appearance. Appearance of both is beyond both is the Nirguna, is the absolute. That absolute, which appears as the um, cosmic and at the individual. Uh -huh. Realizing that, seeing that, how do you realize, what does is, what is realizing or seeing that, what is it constituted by? Uh, Shankaracharya says, Sakshad ahamasmi iti drishti. Directly you realize, I am that. I am that. Then is peace. Shanti. I am the, as water. I am the cosmic, the ocean. As water, I am also the individual, the little wave. Tasmin Rishti Paravar. Then what will happen? Bhidyate Hridayak Granthi. The knot of the heart will be untied. Or actually here, cut. I am always reminded of the Gordian knot, which Alexander the Great cut. Whoever unties the Gordian knot will be the ruler of the world. Everybody tied, but they failed. What did Alexander do? He didn't untie it. He cut it with his sword. Here, you will cut the Gordian knot, the cosmic Gordian knot, which then you become the ruler of the universe. You become the ruler of your life, actually. Instead of being helplessly tossed about in life, you become the ruler. You become free. What is this knot of the heart? It's not a cardiac problem. It is ignorance. Ignorance is the knot of the heart. That which ties us to this limited samsara. When I say I am a samsari, I am born and I grow older and I am afraid. Death comes to me. We are cowards before death. That condition is called samsari. And I don't know where I will go after this. Where have all those my dear ones gone? This is samsari. And I'll be free of that. That is caused by ignorance about not knowing my real nature as, as the absolute. As the little wave who is afraid of where have I come from? Where am I going? Who are all these other waves? And what will happen uh, to me in the future? Uh, all that will go is, is because it does not know that it is water. So, Vidyate Hridaya Granthi, the knot of the heart is cut asunder. There is no more ignorance. The truth is revealed. It is absolutely undeniable. Nothing can delude you after this. Then, Chidyante Sarva Samshaya. All doubts are dissolved or destroyed. Are torn apart. So, doubts. What is the doubt? I understand this, but that but will go away. There is no more possible doubt. Even the doubts which have never come to us, some clever pandit may bring out some doubts. You will immediately cut through the doubts because you, for you, you see the text. See, a pandit who is not enlightened may know the various texts and will struggle to answer questions by referring to this text, that text, bring out new arguments, bring out new ideas and struggle to give some answer. You, on the other hand, will see straight through to the truth. Whenever such a problem is presented, you see straight through. And often, it's amazing that you will see what solution you give to those doubts, uh, probably they are there in some ancient text or the other. Some enlightened master has left behind those answers. It will match with what you say. So, Chidyante Sarva Samshaya. This is called 
asambhavana, the impossibility that I can't be Brahman. I understand technically there is some pure consciousness which is shining through all minds and bodies. But I am just this one little mind and body. So this doubt will go away forever. Then what will happen? Kshiyante chasya karmani. All the karmas, the stored of karmas which have given rise to this life, those karmas will be destroyed forever. They'll be burnt up. The, the karma, literally it says the karmas will decay. They, they will be burnt up in a trice. Sri Ramakrishna says, if you have a mountain of cotton, all our past karma, good and bad, from many lives accumulated, all our negativities and conditionings and our unhappinesses. If you have a mountain of cotton, you set one matchstick in fire and put it into that. Will it? How much time will it take? Within a trice, the entire mountain of cotton will burst into flames and be reduced into ashes. You'll be free of it. You'll be free. A huge, huge burden from lifetimes, ancient lifetimes. It will go up in flame and smoke in a trice. You'll be free. Coming to the details of it. So the three kinds of the karma is supposed to have three components. Sanchita karma. All the total the effects of what we have done in past lives. They are waiting to give results. That is called sanchita karma. That will go away forever. It will not give any more results. Agami karma. Whatever we are generating in this life. Which will give results in future lives. That will also go away. Will, will be burnt up in a trice. There will be no future life. No, neither due to the past karmas which have not been used up yet, nor due to the new karmas which are gen being generated, none of them will give any any um, uh, any result in the future. What about prarabdha karma? Prarabdha karma means that part of my accumulated karma which has started giving ex results in this life. I've been born with this body, with these parents, and this is the drama that's going to play across, play out in my life. What about that? Now, there are two answers to this. One answer is a conventional answer, which says that whatever has started will go on till the end of this body. And many examples are given in classical Vedanta. One is um, the potter's wheel. So the potter is making pot. And the potter suddenly gets up and goes away. And the potter, he has given a certain momentum to the potter's wheel, which spins once or twice and then falls. So the momentum has been given to this body. It has been born. It shall go on till its death. So even if you become enlightened, it will go on. Yeah. Vivekananda uses very nice language in his poem, Song of the Sannyasi. Heed no more than how body lives or goes. Its task is done. Yeah. Let karma float it down. Let one kick this frame and other put garlands on this frame. Heed not. Let karma float it down. Its task is done. Go thou from place to place and help them out of Maya's way. You help, you live a life, you are blessed yourself and your life will be a blessing to everybody else. This is called Jivan Mukti. Prarabdha karma will continue and it's great for the rest of us because that's what makes the enlightened people live amongst us. Not all enlightened people will continue. Some of them die very young. And they see no point in uh, continuing anymore. But Prarabdha Karma generally means that the enlightened one continues amongst us and that's very good. We will call such people Jivan Mukta, free while living in this body. So Prarabdha Karma will continue. Another example that is given is the arrow which has been shot. We did the, uh, the metaphor of the archery, spiritual archery. So the archer uh, shoots arrows. Now there are some arrows. Now consider the arrows to be karma. In the metaphor, the arrow was not karma. Arrow was the sentient being, you yourself, the mind. But here, imagine the arrows of the karmas. We have a quiver of arrows, which you have here. One more arrow in your hand. And one arrow which you have shot, which is flying towards the target. If you decide to stop shooting, then you can throw away the quiver of arrows. You can throw down the arrow which you are going to shoot. But you can't do anything about the arrow which is in flight. So it will go and hit its target. So the arrow in flight is our prarabdha karma, which will continue. These are examples. A modern example might be a fan. You know, if I switch on the fan and then switch it off. But even after I switch it off, it will spin for a couple of times. Another classical example is the axle of a cart. So if the axle is cut, 
the wheel which was rotating will rotate once or twice before falling. Similarly, when enlightenment is attained, all past karmas, shiyante chasya karmani, all past karmas are burnt up like the mountain of cotton in a trice. But if this one will go on, this particular body and mind will go on for a while and then stop. Um, so fan is a good example. I'll tell this story and then I'll also stop like <laughs> Prarabdha Karma. Um, okay, two points. First, the story. So Swami Premeshanandaji was a very great monk of our order, disciple of the Holy Mother and his Sevak, who became my mentor later on, very great Swami himself. He told us the story about the passing of Swami Premeshananda. Um, so the Swami was... Uh, uh, he was being fed. He was quite ill and uh, almost uh, unable to see. So he was being fed by the sevak, by the attendant with a spoon. And he said, Swami, eat. He would have to cajole him like a little child. Eat one more spoon. And the Swami didn't eat. Just kept sat quietly. And the attendant felt something is wrong. So he ran to the doctor who had just come to check the Swami. And the doctor was crossing the courtyard. This was in Banaras in, in Kashi. And the Swami went and caught hold of him. The doctor came back to check and they found no sign of life. Although just a minute before, the person was living. Now, this Swami who told me the story, he said it was like, you know, the ticking of a clock. It goes tick, 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 and then stops. Nothing more. So, that was the end. But it was quite undramatic. You know, sometimes you have amazing uh, experiences at the point of death. Visions and ecstatic experiences. So nothing really happened. It just the person was there one moment, and the next moment not there. Like the ticking of a clock stopped. So this Swami, who told me, he says he went to a very great Vedantic scholar in, in those days in Banaras, another great Swami who has translated the Brahma Sutras in four volumes, um, Swami Vishwarupanandaji, and asked him, so this is what I saw in the passing of Swami Premeshanji, isn't it a little strange that such a great man of enlightenment, so, you know, in such a undramatic way, just was there one moment, the next moment not there. And that Swami got excited. What are you saying? Is this what you saw? And then he showed the scriptural references. This is how a Brahma Jnana, a Jivan Mukta passes away. And so for that person has already realized that he's Brahman long ago. There really isn't a person there. It is because of the force of past karma. This was continuing. The last bit of past karma is exhausted and the body drops. That's it. Nothing. There's no no one to now go elsewhere, attain something more. It's all done long, long ago. All right. The important point to be mentioned. This is the conventional viewpoint. The, the real answer to this, this destruction of past karmas. What happens to prarabdha karma, the karma which is propelling this body? From our perspective, and from the onlooker's perspective, prarabdha karma is continuing and so the enlightened one remains as a jivan mukta, free while living in this body. But from the jivan mukta's perspective, is not touched by prarabdha karma, neither by past karma, nor by any future karma, nor by this particular prarabdha karma. That one knows, I am Brahman. And nothing other than Brahman. This particular play of one little doll, <laughs> you know, uh, one little character in a movie. What is it to me? Nothing to me. It will play out according to its script. It's nothing to me. Just as the playing out of a character in a movie or a dream is nothing to you once you have awakened or once you have seen it as a movie. So the, from the enlightened person's perspective, there is neither past karma, san, accumulated karma, sanchita, nor new karma being generated, agami, not even this prarabdha karma which is being exhausted right now. All right. That's the point I wanted to make. Let me look at the comments here. Ashish says, when listening to Vedanta and checking it, if it's real in your experience, is this mana or nididhyasana? It's nididhyasana. If you have doubts, if you require reasoning, to work out your doubts, that is mananam. But if you are checking continuously with experience, the teachings of Vedanta, that is nididhyasana. Hiram says, is the combination of transcendent and Ishwara only reserved for avatars? No. It is available to all. The, uh, reality, which is beyond uh, 
the cosmos and the individual. The water, which is um, the reality of the ocean and the reality of the wave, but in itself is neither an ocean nor a wave. That's available to all. That's what we actually are. And that is revealed to us by knowledge. Shweta asks, is that what is called a space of Chit Jaragranthi? Absolutely. Chit Jaragranthi is the knot which ties. What does a knot do? It ties two things. Now, what is it that ties you to this body-mind? Actually, nothing. Actually, nothing. Nothing ties us to this body-mind. What is it that ties you to your reflection in the mirror? You'll say nothing. The reflection is just appearing in the mirror. Exactly. As one sadhu put it nicely, what is that knot which ties you to body-mind? The answer was in Hindi, Beokufi Matra Mahatma Ji. Oh Mahatma Ji, oh monk, it is stupidity alone, alone, foolishness alone, which makes you think, I am connected to the destiny of this little body-mind. I am this body-mind. I am somehow connected to it. What happens to it happens to me. None of it is true. If you just keep it in mind and begin to observe life, especially at the point of the death of this body, we'll begin to see, we'll see very clearly, oh, it wasn't me. That's so amazing. It wasn't me means this dead body wasn't me actually. It never was. Gaurav says, all objects are appearing in space of mind and consciousness. Even this sense of physical space appears in our mind. Correct. There's no boundary of inside, outside. That's also very important to see. There's no boundary. See, we feel boundary. This is an important point that Gaurav has pointed out. We feel boundary. What is the boundary? Here is a boundary. Up to this skin is me. Beyond this skin, skin is the boundary. Inside the skin is me. Outside the skin is not me. But this boundary is not really a boundary. Because outside the skin and inside the skin are both appearing to you, the consciousness. Yes, yes, but the consciousness has a boundary. Um... Here, the room is the boundary for the consciousness because I'm aware of what's there in the room, but I'm not aware of what's beyond the room. So my consciousness is a boundary. The limits of my senses, what I can see here. No, no, no. What you can see and hear is the limit of your senses. But beyond the senses, there's a universe that is no, uh, appears to in you in the consciousness as the unknown universe. It is the unsensed universe. So senses have a limit. The body has a limit. The mind has a limit. But all of these, including their limits, are appearing and disappearing in you, the consciousness, which has no limit. So no boundary. That field or condition is not confined to any location in the body. It seems a heart refers to that non-dual consciousness in which everything is appearing, everything is made of, and through which everything appears. Correct. The heart, here's the different levels of understanding the heart. First of all, heart, here, in the center of the body, the space lotus of the heart. Then, more precisely, the mind which is supposed to be here. Then, more precisely, the consciousness which shines in the mind. So, that's what he's saying. That is the heart. This is how Raman Maharshi interpreted the heart. For him, Raman Maharshi, the uh, Hridaya, the heart, was the ultimate reality itself. Atman itself was the heart. Ishwar Goswari says that Birth and death appearance is also maya. Is it only an appearance? Yes. At the level of transaction, it is happening. But from perspective of your real nature, Brahman, it's an appearance in you. Sri Ram says, the birth and death, death belongs to the ego, which ultimately is fiction. Nothing ever had happened. Is this the ultimate truth? Yes. But we have to be careful when saying it. It has to be understood very precisely. Otherwise, it can be badly misunderstood. So it is like Gaudapada Acharya in the Mandukya Karika, uh, who says, there is no cessation of the universe. There is no beginning of the universe. There is no mukti, nor is anybody uh, liberated. But all of that you have to understand in the ultimate sense as Brahman. Brahman. You are Brahman. Therefore, all of these are appearances. Sudhir says, the sadhus who meditate in solitude seem to avoid agami karma so as to reduce anchit karma and to get realization faster. You might say that, but the real point of that is not to fiddle around with your karma accounts. It is to get enlightenment, to realize that you are Brahman. 
if you try to struggle and adjust the accounts of karma, it's endless. There is no real solution to that. Uh, Srinivas Raju says, person doesn't get liberated, you realize you're free from this person. Correct. Atma nitya mukta. Antakaranadi nitya vadha. Yes. You realize you're always free. You don't have to get free from it. But that has to be realized. Uh, it has to be realized. Janhavi says, Brahman is pure awareness, anubhava matra. But for me, the fact of matra is not translated into a vivid experience. But I do experience the world from moment to moment. Can I then take this constant experience as an experience of Ishwara, Saguna Brahman, and be centered in that? Certainly. It is the Virat Brahman, what we were discussing in the 11th chapter of Bhagavad Gita. The cosmic form of Brahman. Will such a disposition eventually lead to dissolution of the Upadhi? Qualifying my experience? Yes. Correct. It will. Shweta says, so it's important to work towards making our mind sattvic so that the bliss aspect of Brahman can manifest. Yes, not only bliss can manifest, all our spiritual sadhana will become effective and easier if we are sattvic. Sonali says we can only be exist pure existence consciousness but not know it in any other way. But know its appearance as a body-mind including the births and death. Is it a correct understanding? Yes. You know it in every knowing. You know it in every knowing. Those who understand, they understand it in every understanding. Those who do not understand, they think the particular experience is required for it. A particular experience can trigger that understanding. And then in every experience you will find that. Apala says, does the Advaitic view of cycle of reincarnation originate in Shankaracharya's commentary? Can we therefore think of the Upanishadic idea of cycle of reincarnation originating in Advaitic view as a reading, retelling, interpretation? Yes, you might say that. But it doesn't originate in Shankaracharya's commentary alone. Because you find it even more clearly and uncompromisingly taught by Gaudapada Acharya, who predated Shankaracharya himself. You find it taught in pre-Shankara, pre-classical Advaita texts like Yoga Vashishta. So this is, seems to be an understanding which existed maybe all the way back to the Upanishads. The Upanishads put it in this way, the language which we have used, which is compatible with Advaita Vedanta, but also with other interpretations, because multiple interpretations have come out of the same uh, Upanishads. And what I want to say here is that the Upanishads do not clearly use uncompromisingly Advaitic language. The uncompromisingly Advaitic language which you find in, say, Ashtavakra or in the Gaudapada Karika on the Mandukya, that you do not find in the original Upanishads except in just places. There is enough scope for non-dualism and dualistic interpretations in the Upanishads, which is why it serves as a matrix for multiple schools which have come afterwards. Om Shanti 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 Hari Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ramakrishna Arpanamastu